Welcome to the Pat Inc. episode of What Does an Understanding System Look Like? This is part of our Next Generation AI series. So what does an understanding system look like? This episode follows on from our last live stream, which was Dr. Walid Saber talking with John Ball around it's not in about scale because it's not in the data. And that was in reference to this ever increasing large language model um, paradigm of more and more language or more and more data, training data and more parameters. So this time we're looking at what makes an understanding system. John Ball is going to talk to us about his theory, pattern theory, and how that solves the problem for NLU, natural language understanding. As this is a pre-recording, um, we welcome you to put your questions and comments down below in, underneath in, you, in the YouTube. Um, so welcome, John. Thank you, Beth. It's nice to be here. And I'll hand over to you now, and so you can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Tell us, all Thank you. tell us all about pattern theory and um, what an understanding system will look like in the future. Excellent. All right. Well, what does an understanding system look like? So uh, as Beth said, it's following on from the, it's not about scale because it's not in the data. And the thing that we're going to look at today is what is in the data? What are we sure is in the data? Uh, and the thing that we're sure about is in a, in a brain, we've got a data feed, if you like, if you want to call it that, of vision and hearing and uh, touch and motion. It's all, all part of our experience. And so we know that there's a lot in there that we should be able to use for things like language understanding. Uh, and the the point that Pat's making for 2023 is that this is the year for the theory of understanding. And the theory of understanding is going to be including things like how do we understand, what's meaning about, uh, and so forth. Uh, the, a key thing, there, there's always been a debate in, um, in artificial intelligence about whether or not uh, there's some type of, um, well, not evolution at play, but... Um, uh, whether whether there's just something innate that's that's um, driving us, and of course there is something innate. It's our brain. It's the way the brain is put together. And what you'll see today is uh, a good way of looking at a brain to understand um, how all of those pieces fit together to show you that the innateness is the thing that drives um, artificial intelligence. Uh, and in uh, humans, we have this extra ability, which is um, language which uh, enables a lot of other things to take place that don't take place in earlier animals. So let's let's start off. So pattern theory uh, is the name that I gave uh, the neuroscience model that I came up with from about 1983 when my professor at Sydney University said we're never going to be able to understand how brains work and how language therefore works. Um, and so that that challenge took me on a a 20 year quest to prove her wrong. And uh, pattern theory um, emerged from that where the, the concept is that brains are storing patterns. Uh, and if you point at any particular point in the brain, there's a pattern atom that's in play at that point. So um, for example, if I could point at say the Jennifer Aniston area that recognizes um, her inside my brain, it would then fan out to the visual experiences, the um, the motion experience of, of seeing her on TV, what she sounds like, um, all of those types of experiences. So it becomes uh, a single um, object in my brain that represents everything to do with that particular entity. Um, the, the, the sad part was that when I finished developing pattern theory about 2000, um, a lot of really interesting work came out a few years later, uh, uh, Jeff Hawkins at um, Numenta came out and he talked about layers of um, the cortex and had a, a very good uh, explanation of what's going on in brains. So um, I'll cover all of that as well. So how do I start talking about pattern theory? The, uh, to me, the first thing to talk about is how brains don't process information, they're matching patterns. And uh, people say that's not you don't need to say that because... Uh, processing 
covers everything. And there's uh, certainly um, in the world today, if you go to a neuroscience area, there'll be a computational neuroscience department in a big university. Uh, there'll be in the linguistics area, a computational linguistics department. There'll be a I don't know, computational psychology department. Pro anything that has to do with cognitive science, there's usually a computational model of it. And the problem is that brings in a lot of, lot of baggage, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. So, so what pattern theory says is that all the brain is doing is storing, matching, and using hierarchical bidirectional link set patterns. Uh, what that means is that the brain can be comprised of simply sets and lists. Uh, and it's, it's very powerful in terms of um, what a brain is doing to help us understand um, the brain theory, pattern theory. So there's no sequential program. Um, we don't have the brain doesn't have to write um, instructions in a sequence in order for things to happen. It doesn't have to do that in parallel. Uh, there's a much better explanation, which is simply using patterns that it's learned through experience and generalizing from that. So uh, back in probably 1990, I came up with um, this very uh, early brain concept. So what, what you can see here is that there's three moving parts. There's some sort of transducer. So a, a transducer is simply converting from some sense modality into, um, well, basically firing neurons. Uh, and that's this section B here. In order for this very simple uh, animal to move, it has muscles and the muscles are controlled by neurons. If the neural, neuron is activated, the, the uh, muscle compresses and that allows for some sort of propulsion. And the controlling system is simply the connection between the, the raw input that's coming from, uh, in this case, the olfactory sense. Um, it's then combined in some manner and if that combination chooses to activate uh, muscles, then uh, this animal can move. So, so think of it as primordial ocean. Um, there's only things that are floating around and suddenly there's this animal that has a sense of smell and control of muscles and something that's controlling that. You can imagine that an animal that could successfully navigate to something it wants to eat and then start eating it uh, or move away from something that might want to eat it, not that there would be anything at this early point, that that animal is going to survive better than the ones that are just sitting there. They're just sitting ducks waiting to be eaten. And so the, the principle that a very, very simple brain is simply working off one sense and motor control then allows for the evolutionary process to continue on. So you can, you can imagine that if um, on the, on the left-hand side of this A figure, uh, you have in, the, uh, in a very simple animal, um, say the sense of smell is active, a particular pattern there, uh, a particular view is active, a particular I don't know, touch is active. Um, if A, B, C, and D are active, it then activates E, which is this is a common um, animal, if you like. And so uh, it, it sort of highlights a deficiency in the model that I had way back then, which is uh, I, I put weights on things. So for some reason, uh, E was more important than, say, this um, this set of things, A, B, C and F are active, which activates G. Uh, the, the, the point is in, in terms of the model, which is, uh, I'll just explain how we can improve on that. If you have this linking area and you get A, B, C, D and F, so basically all these things, both E and G will be active and you then have to select which is the appropriate one. When I say you have to select, context selects the thing that actually makes sense in this particular situation. So it's it it's basically parallel pattern matching and then you can do whatever you like with the output of that. You, as in your brain, can do it. So here's, uh, here's an example. We want to recognize a, a visual image. So here's a box. And the eye is uh, recognizing basically the, you know, through the, the neurons on the back of the eye, it's recognizing the, the shape of this thing. Uh, and I imagine this infinitely long set of objects that has been learned over time. And inside one of those is the object that represents boxes. And inside all of these different ones, uh, the brain can match and see which one makes sense. Uh, and if, in, in this case, what have we got? This one here matches pretty closely that one. And so we've now been able to potentially recognize something and we wanna be able to clarify that 
is a close match to this, uh, but I'll but you'll see how we get there in a moment. So so the concept is there's all of these elements that are connected to a a single input, and then lots and lots of possibly grouped elements that uh, follow from that. Um, in, in the eye itself, we, we can split out color, well, we do split out color between the rods and the cones in the eye, um, and motion is handled in a separate part of the brain in the visual cortex. So um, all we have to do is recognize a, a single snapshot here. Um, so, so that model then leads to this model, which is we've got a bunch of sensors. So this can be vision, auditory, balance, whole bunch. There's no limit to the number of sensors we've got. It then connects to this brain material, which is matching patterns, which then is grouped together to larger patterns, which is then combined. So we, we want all of the patterns to be combined at some point so we can recognize an object. And uh, you, you can imagine in practice how that would work. You see your mother, you hear it. Um, you hear her voice, maybe you can smell her perfume. All of those things go together to represent the object of your mother. It changes over time, so there'll be different representations of it, but you should always be able to recognize your mother, uh, assuming you grow up with her. Um, so that's the, the concept of this combined pattern. And then these combination patterns can combine further. So uh, you can imagine you know, a plate of fish and um, a knife and a fork the way you interact with that fish using your knife and fork and eating and so forth um, is going to be using combinations of these combined patterns. Uh, and so this, this is the basic model that pattern theory was uh, represented by in 2002. So a different way of looking at that with simply um, an eye connecting to its edge pattern because it's the thing that's getting the, the transduced information. Uh, that's recognizing patterns and if it recognizes a pattern based on experience it then uh, transmits it to this next pattern a vision, which is only storing visual patterns obviously so you know if vision is coming in this can only recognize vision because that's what it's connected to this is the innateness concept this thing here is only connected to visual patterns so it's only going to recognize combinations of those visual patterns and then when we hit this next pattern pattern here uh, we're going to be recognizing visual patterns plus auditory patterns because that's how it's been set up um, and we have an auditory transducer here an ear uh, and it's recognizing again just auditory patterns uh, some uh, consolidated pattern from the auditory experience uh, and this was um, a concept of recognizing sequences of sounds that could potentially become a grammar um, we've improved on uh, this model a lot in terms of the language and that's what we'll be talking about uh, in the next show in a week's time. Um, so if we then branch off to, well, what is it we're doing if we're reading, if we're learning a language? Uh, well, you'll have some visual patterns here. So when you read, there's actually a letterbox um, in your occipital lobe. Um, I think it's your occipital lobe that's tracking the uh, um, reading aspect of language. It's tracking the word sequences in some some position uh, but then on the auditory side you have to be able to pronounce you know possibly the letter here the letter i and then you have to be able to recognize the variance in it you could say i or oi depending where you are uh, in, the, in the english speaking world um, so all of those different pronunciations are what we would call a link set pattern because they're representing the same thing and that link set pattern is linking to this which is a bunch of letters that represent i uh, and over here, we then have sequences, which is starting to match language. Um, there's obviously a whole bunch of things we've left out, like the the um, other visual things that we're representing, but that that was just the, uh, a basic way of looking at language analysis. So contrast that, this pattern matching system where you've got sensors coming in and then you're matching patterns in those sensors and then combining them with a digital computer. So let me just have a look at um, this particular website because um, it, it's quite different how processing works. So in a processing system, you've got a central processing unit here, um, an ar arithmetic logic unit that can perform particular operations on registers and store them, and a controlling unit that's making sure the program operates sequentially. So up here in the memory unit, you could store your program of you know, the sequence of things you want to follow, and then this control unit will fetch the information 
um, process it and um, do something, storing it into other registers, and perhaps there'll be something in the memory unit that says, now store this value on a disk, uh, and there's your output function. Uh, there's a point I want to make here. So if we look at the computer itself, here's a Wikipedia page. Here's what a, could be inside an ELU. So you could run a particular instruction. You could plug in the values. This is the four bit, let's say a, a four bit ELU. So you plug in your four values. This logic then takes that performs an operation and outputs a result. So by simply choosing the fixed programs that we've set up, you can have a fair bit of functionality taking place. The reason I want to say that, that this is a very fixed model, which is in the computer uh, processing model is shown here, that if you consider a digital signal, the bits are interpreted as these symbols or letters. So for example, in ASCII code, uh, you might have whatever it is, 16 bits that are representing uh, a particular character, the letter A, for example, and then you can extend that with other techniques. So in a computer system, you're taking this binary code and you're then interpreting it some way based on the type that it happens to represent. In the brain model, that's not what's going on. Um, in the brain model, what's happening is we're interpreting the, um, the signals back to the previous pattern that's been recognized. So you can take a, a pattern in the visual field and project it back to its earlier stage of handling. And that's your representation, the thing that you're representing. Okay, so I just wanted to make that distinction between the processing model, which has uh, the limitation of whatever is stored being interpreted versus the brain model where you're interpreting things that you've experienced. So let's have a closer look at the brain. Um, so this is where people usually start when they talk about the brain, and it doesn't usually go much deeper than this. Uh, we have a neuron here. This is coming from uh, Walter Freeman's book. Um, it's a good book, so uh, I'll, I'll just keep referencing the books that I'm uh, showing uh, examples of, and I'll have a page number if you want to uh, go and check this out. Um, so, so here's a neuron. What does a neuron do? Well, uh, we start with an input uh, and the input can be from other neurons or it could be a transducer uh, and then we go from there to let's see the output so if this reaches a certain threshold of inputs it then fires that's its output uh, the inputs that it gets can be excite excited uh, excitatory that can it can be excite exciting or it can be in, uh, inhibitions uh, and this has uh, been assumed in the neural network field, to the artificial neural network field, to be uh, a way of expressing um, a statistical nature. Um, I prefer to think of it as a pattern matching nature, where if you have something coming in from some sense, you're able to then interpret a number of similar examples without having to change things. So you could inhibit certain things and as a result only get particular patterns being matched. Uh, so this thing firing could be uh, analogous to matching a pattern. Um, so what else have we got in the brain? Well, uh, here we've got rods and cones in an eye. I think this is, what does it say, rods. Uh, this is The blue things are the rods in the eye, so 100 million of them. And those get, uh, because they're, they're actually neurons built in, they then fire when they hit whatever their transduction requirement is, uh, it then fires finishes up in our brain. Um, and on this side here, you've got a muscle where inside this collection of muscle fibers, uh, if, a, if a neuron is activated, it will then um, tighten that particular muscle. If it's not activated, then it won't tighten it. Um, and so muscular control is coming through this massive number of um, nerve fibers that are running to the muscles. So the input to the brain are these huge numbers of neurons that are converting the world into these nervous impulses and our motion is controlled by this huge number of muscular outputs uh, and that's coming from this this particular book those illustrations um, so what does the human brain look like uh, we, we could look at the different brains but let's just look at the human one so um, in, inside my brain we've got something running at about 15 watts of power uh, and that's like a, a very small light bulb um, if you look at the computer that I'm using for the live stream today, well, the recorded live stream, um, this uses about 300 watts to 
uh, handle its processing and charge its battery. So 15 watts versus 300 watts, and the brain does an awful lot. So there's got to be something very efficient going on. Uh, and when we look at this diagram, you can you can see how the evolution of the human brain at any rate, you've got this very large brain here, and then we've got a bunch of things connected to it. So things are the optic nerve, it's coming down this thing, and there's this optic, optic chiasm that splits the signal between left and right. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, we've got some, um, let's see, the vestibular system, so our sense of balance, that's another sense. Uh, and then you've got some outputs going to particular parts on our head. Uh, the, the reason it's engineered this way, it's evolved this way, is because there's no way for the full stream to come in through the, uh, the spinal cord. On this side here, you can see the spinal column with all of its uh, muscular output and sensory input coming through uh, uh, up the spine and into the brain through that mechanism. But you wouldn't be able to get from your eye back down to the spine and back up with any efficiency, so it's much more efficient just to connect directly into the brain. So it's, um, it's not that complicated what a brain is doing. Uh, and when we look at evolution in, in detail using the, the real models, you'll be able to see how this very simple senses in and motor out is replicated uh, over and over. And so if that's our building block, the types of patterns that these very large numbers of inputs are handling is the type of thing that would be beneficial for us in cognitive science to emulate. Okay, so let's go into evol evolution. So th uh, the innateness that we get is coming from previous brains. Um, so as I said, uh, sensory consolidation in, muscular motor control out, uh, and early animals are surviving on the basis of, of these things. Uh, and because they're surviving and reproducing, uh, the that species can continue until a better one comes along, which could be some type of mutation uh, that has some improvements that help it with its survival. Okay, so do animals understand? Well, uh, on the basis of this, animals have similar vision to us, some of it superior to us, uh, and the, the other types of senses they have allow them to do amazing things. You know, m uh, mice can follow through mazes, um, animals can eat, animals can choose to run from certain uh, predators and uh, attack prey. There, there's a a huge complexity available in the animal world. And I'd, I'd like to think that it's something like 90% of the way to artificial intelligence would be found by simply emulating the sensory experience and the motor control of these very simple animals and including balance and the types of things that, uh, that those brains already have may be a, a fast track way of making rapid progress in that. Another area that comes from evolution is this concept of consciousness. A lot of people like to think that consciousness is what drives us. Uh, uh, because the components that activate consciousness in a human brain are actually lower brainstem and uh, they're not the cortex that's driving consciousness, I prefer to think of lots of animals being conscious like the dinosaurs and it's, uh, it's a very good evolutionary benefit. So humans have that, but it's not driving us, it's simply something that we're aware of. Okay, so let's get a, uh, a quick recap of what brains look like as we go back down the evolutionary tree. Um, so you can see here a fish brain. Uh, it's got eyes, it's got um, uh, a nose of some description for olfactory sense, and then it has similar brain components to us. I think there's a, a cerebral uh, cerebellum and um, most of the components you would find in the human brain, even in a fish brain. The reptilian brain's a bit more complicated, but you can still see it's got its two eyes. It's got the crossover embedded in there somewhere for the uh, for vision. Uh, there's its olfact olfactory sense. A mammalian brain's uh, got improvements, uh, and then the human brain is got more improvements. It's certainly got this huge cortex on the outside, but you can see vaguely through here that we've still got the the same type of recognition of uh, olfactory sense, which projects onto older parts of the brain for um, the sense of smell. And there's our huge cerebellum, which has evolved from the one that's there. So there's not uh, a lot of dissimilarity between them. Um, the The idea that the human brain is is uh, just glued on top of, you know, a reptile brain's not sensible either because as the brain has evolved, uh, these elements are all being integrated. But um, 
it's it's nice to see that there are some commonalities and these early mammalian brains are pretty awesome in terms of what they can already do uh, in our quest for natural language understanding and AI. Um, so here's perhaps a, a more common image of the, the human brain. Uh, we've got our frontal lobe here, which is uh, doing things like um, uh, people say planning and the like. Um, uh, on this side, we've got um, uh, our auditory recognition. So word sense that the, the sound of words are detected around here somewhere. Um, our comprehension, which is pulling these different um, areas together. Here's vision and the occipital lobe. Um, our frontal lobe also has the sense of smell and taste um, stored. Uh, hearing, as I said, comes in here. Vision is most of this occipital lobe. Um, spatial awareness is over here. So all, all of these different regions, um, they're not arbitrary. They're based on what projects to what. So in the same way that if your eyes project onto the vision, the occipital lobe, that's only got uh, vision capability, but as it projects forward, it's then connecting to other types of visual patterns. Uh, and eventually it all gets pulled together um, in an area called the entorhinal cortex, which is under here. Uh, so let's, let's keep looking at uh, this way of considering what the brain's doing. So um, we've got motor systems here. This is coming from um, Freeman's book. Motor systems are here. Uh, if it's controlling something, if muscles are being activated, um, then there's a proprioception, basically sense of position of our body, and that's going into our sensory system. And this endorhinal cortex is where all of these senses are coming together, which is, which is important because uh, you want to be able to recognize an object with all of its sensory connections together. It's not magic that we go from visual recognition and auditory recognition to... Um, hearing the sound of your dog, for example, and recognizing what your dog looks like. Uh, it, it, it's all connected through this. Um, and interestingly, the hippocampus here is what's being called a space-time loop. Um, th there was uh, a horrific experiment or test. Somebody, I think they had epilepsy, and so um, to treat them, they just took out the hippocampus. They thought that would be helpful for the ep epilepsy. And unfortunately, it meant that that person could no longer recall new memories. They could remember everything that had gone on in their past, uh, but they weren't able to recall new things that were happening. And, you know, I, I don't remember it's, you know, the order of minutes that they could remember, but not uh, not beyond that. And so the, the question is, is what's going on here? Because if the hippocampus is storing our event memory, you know, you go to a store and you do certain things, how can that possibly relate to what else is going on? Because you can remember all of the old memories, so it can't be storing it. And, and that's where this difference between a processing engine and pattern theory comes into play again. That pattern theory is connecting the experiences that we have in our senses together. And that comes together in the endorhinal cortex. So if you're in a particular scene, if you're at a restaurant and there's other people there, then you know that those other people are there and you can then combine them into a recognition of that. But the, the, the memories of the people and um, what they looked like, what they said, that's stored elsewhere. So all you're doing in uh, the hippocampus is connecting those elements together. So the storage remains in the sensory areas uh, and our um, event is being stored elsewhere. So that's what's coming out of this loop. Uh, here's here's a nice traditional view of the brain, uh, and I've got um, an example from uh, an ABC program I did in 2000, actually 1999, where I talked about this. But if you, if you were sitting up here in your brainstem and you're watching what happens when you throw a ball, um, you would see this massive number of um, sets, uh, a list of sets of uh, muscles to contract in order for all of your muscles to control that throwing of the ball. You, your legs are moving, your head is moving, your arms moving, your torso is twisting. All of those muscles are being controlled and being sent down your brainstem. And while all of that's happening, there's a cascade of sensory experience, your proprioception to keep track of, of uh, what's actually moving at that point in time. So there's this concept of 
a very complex set of muscles to move in a particular sequence for all of this to work. And equally, when we're getting our feedback, uh, we have to be tracking all of that. Now, this finishes up going through the thalamus and projecting onto the sensory cortex. That's uh, where we're re receiving what um, our, you know, from our sense of touch. But the motor control is um, just in front of it, and it's the one sending those muscle sequences. And the cerebellum co coordinates all of that. Um, if we have a look at the ABC program that I did, uh, you can you can see there. I'll I'll include the references to the books and enter this in the description. Uh, you can see here the challenge of throwing a ball. Um, let's see. It was it was actually in Scientific American that I saw it. They talked about a ballistic motion where the brain has to calculate in advance all of the steps to throw a ball. And I thought that's a processing concept. You would calculate all these things and then you would fire off your program. But the pattern theory model is simply storing that those sets of muscle controls in a sequence and throwing it. And that's why pattern theory is based on sets and lists because a list of sets is enough to throw a ball. Um, so, so to plan events, you need planners. It, um, the, the, the thought experiment that I just described is, is pretty powerful. Uh, and uh, this is going back a hundred years. You, you can look at these pictures, and this is just help helping you with what your brain's got to be doing. Uh, but as we're going from image to image, you can see that this horse is galloping. You know, at, at this point, all of its legs are off the ground. At this point, it's got one leg on the ground. At this point, it's standing. So we have this ability to recognize sequences in a part of our visual cortex, uh, and it's just a pattern. Uh, and what makes all of this work is the fact that our anatomy is what it is. Um, so la last point I want to make just about the, the, the basics was consciousness again. Um, it is located in early brain areas. Uh, there has been a lot of work looking at um, what sort of damage can really impact consciousness. Uh, and in terms of pattern theory, we simply say, look, that's an early brain function. Um, it does give us a sense of awareness. It does have a great evolutionary benefit because, you know, if something starts eating my arm off and I feel this pain and it's just, you know, this one animal that is being attacked, it's me, I then pull my arm away and I try and do whatever it takes to stop that from happening. Uh, but in terms of language, as I'm talking to you now, there is, it's not a conscious in advance thing. I'm not planning the words that I'm saying in my consciousness. I'm actually participating in the similar way to you. I'm just saying what I'm saying and I'm hearing what I'm saying as I'm doing it. Um, there is a good section in uh, Freeman's book on consciousness and sensory experience and so forth. Um, now, what, what's going on in the brain? Let's just go another level below the, the simple neuron. And uh, in, our, in our cortex, it's often said there's six layers. Um, so here's a newborn six layers of, uh, of the cortex. Um, as we're three months old, you can see it rapidly grows six years old. Uh, and this is, this is uh, an adult level brain region. Um, you can see there's an awful lot of these neurons that are there. Uh, but that, that's not a great model to understand what's going on. We need to improve the science beyond, well, we've got some stuff where these neurons fire. Uh, and Jeff Hawkins' um, solution in 2005, this is from his On Intelligence book, I think uh, helps a lot. And per personally, it aligns perfectly with pattern theory, so that's another reason I, I think it helps a lot. Uh, so here's his model. You've got uh, sensors plugging into this layer of cortex, and that layer of cortex projects onto this layer of cortex, which projects onto this layer of cortex, which projects to this region. So each of these areas are little regions. Um, inside the region, you've got these columns. Uh, and he goes into detail, which I hadn't seen before, which is great, which shows um, how the brain is putting these regions together. So um, inputs, here's the upward flow of information. So uh, information into one of these regions hits layer four, layer four projects onto layers two and three, and then layers two and three projects onto the next region. Uh, so when we talk about regions projecting to the next ones, well, it's physically in the anatomy that it does that. And then there's a, a reverse link. So uh, when uh, when something is active in a higher region, it can come back to the previous level one region. 
And so all, all of all of this concept in this book is explained. Um, there's the page references, uh, but it aligns perfectly with pattern theory with this bidirectional linking model. Um, the, the reason, again, pattern theory uses the bidirectional linking model is if you can recognize something in, say, your visual area and you you signal the fact that you've recognized it, you don't have to encode it and uh, compress it and send it forward. You simply have to say, hey, this is what I've recognized. That connects to something else that goes, oh, when that is active, it means this, and it can then um, be manipulated in our brain without having to encode information and send it around. Uh, okay, so here's um, just, again, the concept that humans brain, human brains are extending earlier brains. Um, so things like the entorhinal cortex, the hippocampus are in earlier animals to us. Uh, as our brain has grown, it's given us new um, extensions to our senses and so better capabilities of those senses, but it's still plugging together in a very similar way to earlier brains as, as we looked at before. Now let's compare that with an artificial neural network. Um, so this is coming from Wikipedia. Uh, and we have this diagram here where you get your inputs. Uh, if you hit your threshold, it then signals your output and then um, those outputs can do something. So that leads to this artificial neural network where you start with inputs, you have one or more hidden layers in a deep learning model the number of hidden layers can be quite deep. And then you've got your output layer. So the, the concept is you put your, whatever the thing that you're testing for, you put that as your input, uh, and then you look to see what comes out of your output and deep learning's training method uh, uh, repetitively puts inputs to produce the expected outputs through um, uh, a reverse, reverse loops in here. Uh, but it's very different to the human brain model where the senses are integrated with your neural network. Okay, so brains understand. This This is where we're going to really hit the, the point of understanding. Uh, and I think the visual understanding is the best way to convey this uh, because next week we're going to talk in detail about the, the way we um, we use language to emulate all of this. So when I look here, um, there's an elephant, yeah, but it's not just an elephant. We've got, I can see an elephant ear, there's a wet patch on its ear, um, there's a tusk, it's got dirt on its tusk. It's This black stuff looks like it's mud, it's blowing black stuff out of its trunk, and as its trunk is swung back, you can see it's going to land on its back because the elephant's trying to cool itself, I guess, and cover itself with uh, with mud. Below it, you can see there's... Um, there's standing water, there's mud, there's little plant, there's trees. So um, there's the sky. W when I look at this image, I understand all of the things going on. I understand the motion. I understand the things that are in it. Um, in this image, you can see a bunch of elephants. They're walking away. I still know it's an elephant, even though it looks very different to this. Here's an elephant walking sideways. I know it's walking because I can see a leg up in the air. I can see these legs crossing, so it's not standing still. Um, here's an elephant. It's a baby one. Now, it could be a pygmy elephant, but then this big elephant might go, I don't know who you are, and crush it. So it, uh, I think it's likely to be a baby ele elephant. So our recognition capabilities aren't just coming from vision. It's coming from our knowledge of the world, which we've learned through experience. Um, and here's the black and white picture. Interestingly, in this black and white picture, you can see the trunk there. Uh, here's a reflection of the trunk. It's not an elephant here. It's a reflection. It's uh, you can see there's some deviations there because it's coming off the water. And so all of this is water. You can see a reflection there too. So this is what we talk about with understanding. It's not good enough to just label something. You have to understand in depth all of these things that are going on. And interestingly, when you get to language, the same things that are um, evident here with a picture are also required for language. Um, I got those photos online, by the way. Um, so I, I like giving the accreditation so you can get those photos for your wall or, you know, um, whatever you'd like to do with them. Um, now here, uh, a, a couple of years ago, we um, I did a video that was explaining uh, the detail about what the brain would look like for these 
uh, different types of problems. Um, so, for example, if you're learning the pattern C, um, the letter C, uh, there's a whole bunch of different fonts here. And because they're all Cs, you hope that your brain can recognize that. So these patterns we're projecting onto this set of elements. And each one of these elements, which is representing one of those Cs, would be matching the C. Um, and I talk about how that works in the uh, that companion video about language acquisition. Uh, but here's where the challenge comes from with language, uh, with the brain, in fact. So if we start with our input, your eye sees CAT in that visual field, and the visual patterns for these elements recognize the letters C, A, and T, and then they project forward to the sequence, because uh, in pattern theory we uh, only allow atomic values. You can't have um, a C plus an A to be a particular thing. It's got to be the combination of C and A. So, so here we've got the letter sequence CAT, which would be recognized by CAT, and we also recognize ACT because the same elements are recognized, but not in the right order. But um, for error correction, the fact that we've got the same elements found uh, can be helpful. So in this labeled model, you can see what's going on, and it's bidirectional links. So if you have CAT, you can go backwards and find C plus A plus T, and you can go back to visual recognition. Um, as its uh, original representation. But if we convert it to what you really see, which is an un unlabeled bunch of neurons, you basically got three neurons here or three X's that represent those three X's. None of those things have any labels on them and you have to go back to the sensory experience to recognize it. So it's a very alien concept to the one that we have in computers and the processing model where we encode things uh, and that representation is good enough to um, to be relied on in the future. In this case, in each brain, it'll be different, but you have to work back to the sensory experience to work out what's going on. Um, so what other tricks have we got in our visual field? Uh, and, and a lot of pattern theory um, does use these concepts from gestalt psychology. Uh, we won't spend long on it, just a couple of minutes, but um, you can see here, this is, um, this is a goblet. You can pick that up, right? That black goblet. But if you look at it closely, you can also see there's two faces here. And when I do it, when I'm looking at these two faces, I see the nose and the mouth, and there's another nose and mouth on this, this one. Uh, and yet it's part of the goblet. So if I see the nose and mouth, I, uh, I'm only perceiving the two heads. But if I pull back and I look at the goblet, I only see the goblet. You can't see both at the same time. And that's where this, this idea of not waiting what we see, not waiting what we experience, but simply experiencing what we have and then your attention is going to go on to something. Your context is being handled by the brain to then uh, perceive what's going on. Um, here's the, the Necker cube example. Is this the front of the cube, that square, uh, or is this the front of the cube? And it changes the whole way to look at that particular three-dimensional object, even though it's just a bunch of lines. Um, and you can see the, the, the brain with the pattern matching model, this triangle here, which isn't there, and it's only a couple of lines in the circles. The fact that you can perceive a triangle makes sense if you're looking back from a higher level of pattern back on this image. Um, you know, here's a, that something coming up behind a, a plane. Maybe it's uh, an octopus or something. Here's something snaking around a pole an invisible pole. And here's a three-dimensional sphere with some things coming out of it. Now, let's, let's just compare that model where you can see what your brain's doing with uh, how the deep learning model worked in, this is 2012, so this was, uh, I, I guess, an ImageNet example. Um, there's our reference from Wikipedia again. Uh, and what happens here is they're they're giving you the deep learning approach of you would train lots of models of elephant and somebody would label each of those images as elephant. So when you see this, uh, the argument is that inside the deep learning, um, the, um, the neuron, neuron layers, it's coming up with something like this, which then hits the elephant label. Um, so the, the problem with this type of model is it's not understanding, it's simply activating this. Uh, if, if we look at the linguistic model, we use word vectors. We, as in the industry, uses word vectors or um, encoded ones with a transformer. 
which is just a different type of word vector. Uh, it's it's basically hitting a single thing, and uh, there's a lot more to a word than just how it's related to the other words. There's a lot more to this picture than elephant. It's a standing elephant. It's got it's pointing to the left. There's a, there's trees behind it. There's a I don't know. It looks like a pile of hay in front of it. Those are the things we need to understand. So in summary, uh, and I'm going to finish up on this slide, that it's the sense in a brain, senses enable motor control. And we can have different senses. Bats have sonar to fly at night. Um, uh, sharks have this lateral line that allows them to, to sense things in the water. Um, patterns in brains are hierarchical because you start with sensory information and then there's layers of refinement of those patterns that um, that happen inside the brain before it then uh, comes back out through some sort of motor control. It's, they're not connected. Uh, and they're bidirectional. Uh, we know they're bidirectional because the architecture is bidirectional. The anatomy is bidirectional. So in pattern theory, we're simply expanding the information like the C example. You've got all of those different Cs. Uh, you can recognize all of them as a particular thing and then you can use that particular thing. So it's very, um, uh, very accurate. So the, the concept of search with this model, um, I'll go on to at another time. So, so basically we get all this generalization and understanding because we're keeping track of all of these different things in the brain. In symbolic AI or machine learning, it's all about having more computing power, run more programs, do more analysis, um, have bigger trained models with more data. Um, and the, the way they work is um, if you wanted to have sensors, you, you um, add those at the beginning of your system. So you would add pictures to go and train your network. It's not eyes as part of your system at the moment in machine learning. And we start from scratch each time. Um, one of the open challenges I saw Jeffrey Hinton was talking about this. He was looking for how you can identify the parts of things from vision. And my argument would be that's not how human brains work. We don't look for the parts of things. We actually uh, learn about them in a multi-sensory way, which then helps us with the parts that comprise particular objects. To do it only with vision would be a much more complicated example. And then ultimately the processing model, we compress things. And that's the reason we have search engines because we've compressed and then um, used that compressed format and copied it many, many times. And you then have to go and find out where it's been copied with things like uh, web crawlers and the, the like. So there's a lot of duplication. Okay, so what do we do next time? Well, the path forward, um, we'll be looking at how natural language understanding works and how we can leverage pattern theory um, to build a model that we can scale for the next thousand years. Why a thousand years? Once you're working off meaning representations, maybe you can improve the meaning representations, but if you can convert a meaning representation into any language of your choice, you can continue to evolve your languages and continue to translate from that meaning repository um, into other things. And um, I've shown this model before. This is what we'll be talking about next time where we're going from particular languages here uh, which is language specific into a meaning representation. And this aligns very nicely with uh, what we've been talking about today. So at that point, um, yeah, let's uh, see if Beth, you've surfaced any questions. Um, perhaps we can discuss them now. I guess um, my parting question would be around la large language models. In 2022, we saw the paradigm of the massive text generators or generation, text generation that comes out of these LLMs. Do you see the, uh, their propensity for, for asserting falsehoods as facts as something they can get over? Or is that part of the dilemma and problem that they don't understand? Uh, I think the fact that they come out with falsehoods they could get over. But when you look at the, the stack, the, the process that they follow, they've trained, in the case of ChatGPT, they've trained the um, GPT 3.5 model. Uh, the output of that, they then have taken and they've got people manually 
annotating output of that and then based on the output that they produce they have other people manually annotating the results so there's a lot of um, uh, personal interaction set up to make that make that happen um, and it, the, the reason that has to happen is because it's not understanding it with any accuracy what's going on so is it would it be possible to do yeah I think you'd be able to uh, backtrack for example to sources but I can't see that you then start with GPT 3.5 you'd have to come out with a different model that's not just this uh, prediction engine looking for the next word uh, and my, my suggestion would be it's going to be easier to take a version of pattern theory and take that forward than to try and retrofit into uh, a, a um, transformer model the types of things we've just talked about Okay, then we'll look forward to that in the, in the next episode of this next generation AI. And um, if it, there's any questions or comments, please leave them below in the YouTube recording and I'll make sure John gets back to you. Thanks, John. Thanks for listening. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.